إن أردتم أن تكونوا شامة بين الورى فاختفوا آثار جيل للمعالي سطرا إن أردتم أن تكونوا شامة بين الورى فاختفوا Sunday school, the halaqat, the women's programs, the youth programs, the sports activities May Allah Azza wa Jal continue to put barakah in all of those things and save you and shelter you from all kinds of disagreements and arguments and ill feelings towards one another and allow you to really t- serve first and foremost yourselves and your families for the sake of Allah and then the, the extended community here so the word of Allah can spread. So I wanted to, in this uh, brief conversation with all of you, share a couple of ayat. Some of them belong to Surah Al-Ankabut when I recited in the beginning of this talk. That's the 29th surah of the Qur'an. And then I'll take you further down, historically at least, to Surah Al-Baqarah and something else I'll share with you from Surah Al-Baqarah. And those two things essentially are the, the centerpiece of what I want to share with you today. Did the mic just go off? Or? Okay. All right. So when the Prophet ﷺ was doing his best to deliver the message of Islam, there were different kinds of reactions by people. Of course, the minority reaction was that people believed in him. That's the minority reaction. The majority reaction was people did not believe. And of the people that didn't believe, they had different kinds of reasons. Not everybody disbelieved for the same reason. And the intensity with which they disbelieved, the fervor with which they disagreed with the Prophet ﷺ, also it varied. Some people absolutely hated Islam. They couldn't stand the Qur'an. Some people just didn't know about it. And when they heard about it, they're like, ah, I don't need to pay more attention. I got other stuff going on in my life. You know, they don't have to pay attention to it. And they only paid attention to it much, 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 much later in their life. Then there were the people who were hearing about the message of Islam consistently. And they didn't necessarily hate it, but they just, you know, there's a kind of personality that always wants to counter-argue. It never wants to accept something. It just wants to come up with a counter-argument. In Arabic, there's a saying, لِكُلِّ خِطَابٍ جَوَابٍ Every speech has a counter-argument. Every, everything has a commentary. Right? So their idea of... And then by the way, there is a certain kind of person. The only time they feel intelligent is when they criticize somebody else. And that's a pretty good indication of a lack of intelligence, by the way. And low self-esteem on top of that. That the only time you can display the value of your intellect is by putting somebody else down. Or by dismantling their idea or criticizing, critiquing. Right? And interestingly enough, in modern academics, that's essentially, especially in the social sciences, that's how PhDs are done. You present your thesis before a panel of experts, and they all try to one-up one another in trying to criticize your paper, and they're not really interested in criticizing your paper, they're interested in proving to the next guy sitting next to them, the other PhD, that they know more than them. So they'll try to ask a harder question. And you're caught in the middle of all of that politics presenting your paper. (laughs) Right? But this is, this is a modern mind, but this, is, this mentality has always been there. And one of the ways in which people try to say that they're smarter than the message of Islam, or the Qur'an, yeah, it sounds like it's some beautiful things, but here, here are some questions I have for you. And the question that basically was by the end of the Meccan period. So the Prophet's been delivering the message, sallallahu alayhi wa for a little over a decade already, or almost a decade. And by the end of it, all these different kinds of questions, is he insane? Is he stealing these words from somebody else? These kinds of questions start, started watering down, withering away. And there was one main criticism that remained, that they would not want to let go of. And this is the criticism you'll find in later Makkan surahs. It's repeated over and over and over again. This one criticism that they kept coming up with. What we're going to learn in this surah is Allah not only just quotes that criticism, He cites that criticism, but He responds to that criticism too. And I'll try to explain to you a couple of the reasons for which Allah Azza wa responds to that criticism. So let's read this criticism. First and foremost, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ the prophet, the prophet is told by Allah Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ You were not someone who were reading any kind of a book whatsoever. The Arabic word ma is used not just in nafi, the rad. They say for refutation. There is one thing to say, I didn't go to work. It's another to say, no, I didn't go to work. When you say, I didn't go to work, you're answering the question, did you go to work? And your answer is, I didn't go to work. Somebody says, hey, you went to work, didn't you? And you say, no, 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 I didn't. 
Now you're not just negating, you are what? Refuting. You're refuting. In Arabic, when you negate, you say la. Or lam. When you refute, you say ma. But it's for refutation. So when you read ma in the Quran for negation, what it means is somebody said something incorrect, and Allah is correcting them. So Allah, whatever Allah is saying here in the negative, they've said something in the positive before. So let's see what Allah says. Allah says, you did not write anything with your, you didn't read anything with your, uh, with your, by yourself of any book whatsoever before this. You did not at all ever read. Meaning the Prophet is being told you're incapable, you have been incapable of reading. You're a Nabi and Ummi. As you are when you come out of your mother. As, you know, unlettered as you would. When, as you would be when you come out of your mother. In other words, one of the allegations is this book has too much history. It's got too much wisdom. It's got too much knowledge. It's got too much style. It's got too much eloquence. It's got too much majesty. How did this man who didn't speak like this at all yesterday, and all of a sudden he's talking like this, we never heard anything like this, he must be getting it from somewhere. He must be reading some secret books or something. Allah says, no, you know. You weren't reading any book whatsoever. And then, Maybe he sat home, and hours and hours he spent writing this stuff down. And you know when you write the first draft, then you go back and you edit it, and you fix it, and you say, maybe this draft is better. And then you put some, take some words out, add some words in, and you, you work on it, etc. You know, my, my, one of my, my eldest daughter was recently in a poetry competition, and she's scratching away, writing this poem, writing this poem, writing this poem, and she's taking this word out, adding that word in, taking this word out, adding that word in. It's a process, especially in creative writing. It's a process. Alhamdulillah, she won. <laughs> But anyway, but I, I mean, I know the ugly drafts that she went through to get there, you know? The ones I read, I was like, what is that? Is he not a poetry? It's giving me an allergic reaction, you know? But, you know, there, there is a process involved. So the other allegation was maybe the Prophet, this man, they don't say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what we do. Maybe he just went and he went through multiple drafts and wrote this down, and then he's presenting it to us, the perfect version. That's why it's so good. Because when somebody just speaks, they're bound to make mistakes. They're bound. I mean, linguistics will prove this to you. As I am speaking to you now, I can't even count how many grammatical mistakes I probably have already made as I'm speaking to you. How many redundancies I've already had. How many times I've repeated myself or, or engaged in or, you know, run-on sentences. You know, it, it's, it's inevitable for human beings. But when you're speaking and it's just coming out perfect, you know what the first reaction of anybody listening is? If I was speaking to you in like absolutely perfect English, you would say that isn't natural. Nobody talks like that. He memorized this. He wrote this ahead of time. He rehearsed this. So that's the allegation against the Prophet. You didn't write it with your hand. Why? Because Allah did you, didn't make him capable of writing with his hand. If in fact those who want to make prove that this is a lie, and Mubtil, and Mubtil is the one who doesn't just lie, but he tries to prove something to be a lie. The ones who want to dismantle, invalidate this message, that's all they want to prove is somehow you plagiarized this message, you took it yourself, you learned it from some other source, you know, and then you're presenting the drafted version. In case you're falling into doubt, you already know and they already know that you have no such background. By the way, to this day, to this day, when you go to uh, universities to study Islamic studies, which should be really called un-Islamic studies, in many of these universities, and they try to, sh you know, you do a PhD in, you know, Islamic civilization or the Quran or something like that, what's the primary thesis? This has to be from, he, he must have plagiarized it from Christian sources, Jewish sources, he must have taken it from this place or that place, entire theses are written on this stuff. When you go to the library at NYU and you put in Quran, or you put in Muhammad to do a search on articles, papers, etc., etc., you're going to find all these papers written by non-Muslims, you know, or people that have Muslims, Muslim names but not much more, that are entirely dedicated to showing how, you know, this is all a myth. This is all just taken excerpts, stolen excerpts from different parts of the Bible or the Torah, the Torah, etc., etc., etc. That's all this is. So this allegation that's found in academia now isn't new. It was already there at the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But this isn't even the last allegation. The last allegation is coming. Listen to this. And they said, how come, 
How come no miracles, ayat, miraculous signs, how come no miracles come down upon him from his master? After all, Jesus had his miracles. Moses had his miracles. You talk about Saleh and the, the she-camel. That was a pretty awesome miracle. Abraham had his miracles. How come this prophet doesn't have any miracles? How come nothing, nothing for us to see? No special effects, nothing. No, no dirt turning into a bird. No stick turning into a snake. No water parting. No like chopped up, you know, bodies of chicken and then they come back together and become a chicken again or a bird again. Nothing. What you got? All you got is these words. I mean, if you really are a prophet, show us something. Show us something. At least, at least show us some kind of a miracle. Have you ever heard the phrase, I'll believe it when I see it? Have you ever heard that before? That was their ad final attitude. Listen, what you have to say sounds pretty cool. Doesn't even sound like it's yours, actually. I think it's another source. By the way, when you say it's not the Prophet's words, incidentally, think about this logically. If the disbeliever is saying, these words are not yours, you probably got them from somewhere else. Is that true? It is true. <laughs> that is true. It's already half of faith. You've already acknowledged these words are not his own. So even in their allegation of disbelief, half of, half of that's true. Now, where did he get it from? Allah. And where they're saying he gets it from? The people of the book. The other half is the falsehood. But first half, they've already understood this can't be his own. Even that much they accept. SubhanAllah. Despite that, they say it's not enough for us. You gotta show us something. You gotta show us, you know, like, you know, the, the Arabian Peninsula is kind of dry. If you could just create some farmland automatically, ask God to create some farmland, that would work. That would be pretty impressive, actually. I mean, I'm ready to become anything you want, if you could do that. Or how about this? We're kind of poor. You know, the Romans, they're pretty, doing pretty well for themselves. And these Persians, they got, they got, they got hooked up. How about you produce some oil, some, some, not oil yet, but... <laughs> Some gold from the ground. How about some just gold to just pop out of the ground? Or water springs everywhere. How about that? If you could do that, I mean, we're willing to listen. Oh, how about this? We used to trust our elders. Our elders were people of a lot of wisdom and some of them died. So if you can ask your God to bring them back to life so they can hold a community hall meeting and then tell us, listen, this guy is truly a messenger. Look at me, I just came back from the dead just to tell you that. If you could do that, I mean, you've got yourself a deal. On top of that, that, later on, the Jewish tribes, when the Prophet came into contact with certain Jewish tribes, they came up with different requests. You know, and even before that, some, some of the Arabs came up with a request, so who gives you the message? Who delivers the message to you? God himself? He says, no, eh? the angel Jibreel. The angel comes and delivers the message. Okay, let's see him. Can we have a chat with him? I mean, he talks to you, why can't he talk to us? We're right here. We're available. Oh, only you can see him? Oh, how convenient. Only you can see him. You know, they'd say that, let's see the angel. The Jewish tribes would come and say, you know what, back in the day, in, 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 in Bani Israel's tradition, we learned that when Allah would accept a sacrifice, when you would sacrifice an animal, you don't know if the sacrifice you made is maqbul or not. It's acceptable with Allah or not. Did Allah accept that sacrifice or no? So the old historical tradition is Allah would miraculously send a fire from the sky and it would consume the sacrifice. And that's how you would know that Allah has accepted the sacrifice. That's actually what we learn in the details of the story of Habil al-Qabil. فَتُقُبِّلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمَا وَلَمْ يُتَقَبَّلْ مِنَ الْآخَرِ For one of them, the sacrifice was accepted by Allah. The other, it wasn't accepted. How would you know? When you and I go to Hajj, when we come back from Hajj, how do we know? This one, this one got accepted, this one didn't. We don't know. But back in the day, Allah would send a fire. So, members of Bani Ismail said, how come? You know what? If you do a sacrifice right now and fire comes and eats it from the sky, we're ready to go with it. We're ready to accept. All of these demands had one thing in common. We will believe when we what? When we see. These words are not enough. These words are not enough. That's the common theme among all of these. I talk about this at length when I teach through Rahman. And what I, I'll share one piece of that with you. Alhamdulillah, this is a beautiful building. If there was an announcement made, brothers and sisters, Please exit the building. There's some, this is a fire drill or something, please exit the building. Of course you're Muslim, so you take your time. But eventually, you'd exit the building. And of course, if we said exit the building in a straight line, 
that would must that must be a message to the kuffar because we don't hear those things. Straight line, park within the line. I mean, it's like almost against the sunnah or something for us. Where you can't do it. Or incapable. Okay. Or you know, but imagine this: if there's a cat in the building, if there's a small bird in the building, it also hears the announcement, isn't it? Does it exit the building when it hears the announcement? No. When you're driving on the highway and you're listening to the traffic radio, you do that sometimes? I mean, I don't know if you get traffic out here, but... <laughs> I'm just saying. I used to be in New York, I listened to traffic radio all the time. Yes, the confidence source, traffic radio. And they would tell me, that up on the LIE, three miles ahead, there's an accident, take the exit. If you're going eastbound, take an exit. I didn't say, man, these kaf- these kuffar are trying to trick me. I'm only going to take, you know, <laughs> When a corrupt source comes to you with news and verified, until my imam tells me to take the exit, I am not. <laughs> I'm going to take the exit. Okay? Did I see the traffic? No. No. Since information came to me from a reliable source, and the radio is not a video, it's not TV. I don't see the Doppler radio or whatever. I don't love a video, like the helicopter footage of the exit. I don't see anything. I just see a reporter tell me, look, take the exit. And I said, no, you coffee, I'm going to go straight. I'm going to say that. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is human beings, when they listen to a message, and it makes sense, and it's coming from a reliable source, they take it. They take it. You know what kind of creature is not able to take it? What kind of creature only believes what he or she sees? Animals. When the Quraysh are saying, we will only believe when we see when we will only believe when we see. That's the only way you will convince me. Until you, until you show me, I'm not, I'm not moving from my place. What have they already claimed about themselves? I behave like what behaves? An animal behaves. And a human being is clearly distinct from animals because human beings can be convinced through words. They don't have to smell the smoke. They don't have to feel the heat of a fire to move. They can just be told there's a fire. They can move. It just has to come from a reliable source and it has to make sense. These are the criteria. You know, so, so one thing already. When they made this criticism, it was actually already an insult against their own selves. Reason itself is not enough. We are convinced the way animals get convinced. It's no surprise then. It's no surprise how they are treated in judge- judgment day. When you read their, their, their examples, especially in Surah Rahman, where Allah talked about the gift of language in the beginning of the surah, why? Because you're human beings, you should use your language to get to the truth. Why do you have to believe, see, believe only when you see? Allah talks about the kuffar being grabbed by their head and their feet and being thrown into the fire. You know, back in the old days, the Arabs used to roast animals and they didn't chop it up into small pieces and put them in plastic bags and put them in the meat store. How would they roast the animal? They'd skin the animal and some people would grab the head, other people would grab the feet, and they tie it to a huge log of wood, and then put it on top of a flame and roast it like that. You can imagine this scene? Of course you can't, because you've never seen a movie, you're too religious. But, you know, <laughs> but you can imagine the animal, when it's roasted, it's grabbed by the head and the feet. When Allah says, فَيُؤْخَذُ بِالنَّوَاسِ وَالْأَقْدَامِ The criminal on judgment day is being thrown into hellfire, and how is he being grabbed? By the heads and the feet. He's being treated like what? An animal. And basically Allah is saying in between the lines, in the Nabiba bin Al-Sharati Yafham, the smart one can understand from the hint that Allah is dropping. In Urdu they say, Aqal Ban Kili Ishara Kafi hai. Right? What is Allah saying? Allah is saying, look, you wanted to only believe when you see like animals, there's no surprise you should be treated like an animal. That's what you wanted. That's what you want. Now come back to this ayah, the one I want to share with you. Awalam yakfi him. They said to the Prophet, how come the miracles come to him? How come the miraculous signs come to him? What's Allah's response? Awalam yakfihim. Isn't it enough for them? Anna anzalna alaykal kitaba yutla alayhim. That we have sent upon you, that we have sent upon you the book. That's to be read upon them. The fact that the Quran is being read upon them according to Allah should be enough. You don't need anything more. There's enough for you. SubhanAllah. Allah is saying you should be as convinced, as amazed by revelation 
as you would be if you saw a water party. If you saw a stick turn into a snake. I mean, I don't want to create chaos here, but if I had a stick, and it just automatically, just out of nowhere, turned into a giant snake out of nowhere. It's not even small snake. It's hayya, moving a lot. Thu'ban, it's huge. Two different aspects of it are highlighted in the Quran. So it's a giant, it's one of those Discovery Channel pythons. The ones that eat baby lamb. Thing shows up up here on the member. What's going to happen next in the masjid? Will there be a reaction? Will there be fear? Like, <laughs> And some of you really psychotic ones will pay, pull out your webcam and like, like I find out it's on YouTube. It's awesome. <laughs> Last thing you see on the camera is this. <laughs> right? But there'll be a reaction, right? There'll be amazement, shock, fear. Allah is saying if that's the reaction to a stick turning into a snake. Can you imagine the people that were following Musa salam and the water parted? Just looking at that? Man, the feeling you must have had. And Allah is saying to the Quraysh, that feeling is possible for you by what means? Quran is being read on. That is enough. That is the substitute for all of those things. That is the substitute for all of those things. This is a con- this, the reason I brought this up is because this is one of the passages in the Quran in which Allah Azza wa Jal says a very bold thing. A very powerful thing. If somebody really wants to be convinced, really, really wants to be convinced that Islam is the truth, all they really have to genuinely experience is the Qur'an. If they experience the Qur'an, there will be no doubt left in their hearts. (coughs) But if you have the attitude that you just want to keep on criticizing, you don't genuinely come to the Qur'an. You don't genuinely. You came, before you even came, you said, I'm going to come. Find some way of criticizing it. Some counter-argument I'll dig up. You came with an ego problem, a greed problem, a selfishness problem, a laziness problem. You came with a problem intent to the Qur'an. Then you'll get nothing out of it. you get nothing out of it. Fir'aun also saw the staff turning into a snake, didn't he? Fir'aun saw it too. The magician saw it too. The people saw it too. Everybody saw it. Did everybody have the same reaction? No. You could see a miracle and still not have the same reaction. Are there people who crossed the water with Musa salam that later on gave Musa salam the hardest time? Can you imagine? They just saw the greatest miracle possible in their life. They went through a body of water with water on both sides standing up like a dam without walls. And they walked right through. And they saw the Fir'aun who claimed to be God get crushed before their own eyes. That same Fir'aun, nobody would make eye contact with it. That same Fir'aun is crushed in front of their own eyes. And they get on the other end and they become skeptical about Musa alayhi salam again. I'm not so sure if he's a prophet. I don't know about that. My God! When you have a problem in here, then this stops working really well. When there's a problem in the heart, then the mind kind of gets fuzzy. It kind of gets fuzzy. Now I want to come to the next part of this conversation. The Qur'an to us, it, when the words of Allah are heard, they attack two things in us. They attack our minds, the words of Allah, and they also attack our hearts. Our, our minds are submitted before Allah's words. And our hearts are submitted before Allah's words. When we deeply reflect on the Qur'an, Allah talks about reflection on the Qur'an in two dimensions. An intellectual dimension, I know there are youth here, so I don't want to get too abstract, but an intellectual dimension and a spiritual dimension. There's tadabbur in the aqal and there's tadabbur in the qal. There's reflection on the Qur'an in your mind and there's reflection in the heart. Now let me explain in simple language what the difference is. Two places Allah Azza wa mentions this. One time Allah mentions uh, reflection in the mind, other time He mentions reflection in the heart. Screen saver, you're fine. That is crazy. That's a really psychedelic screensaver, by the way. Okay, sorry. Cool. All right. So, what kind of reflection are there? Let me see if you were listening or alive. Or what are they? Mind and heart. What does it mean, reflection in the mind? It means the more you study the Quran genuinely, the more you will become intellectually, rationally convinced that this can only be God's word. 
Your intellectual fortitude in the Qur'an gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُ لَا الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوءٍ Not that one. أَوَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِي غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Well, don't they reflect on the Qur'an? Had it been from anyone other than Allah, they would have found a lot of contradiction in it. In other words, the more you study it, you will find there's no contradiction. And the only thing left in your mind that will get solidified is this can only be from Allah. That's intellectual tadabbur. In Surah Muhammad, he mentions the other tadabbur. He says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Don't they reflect on the Qur'an? Or is it the problem that the hearts have been placed, locks have been placed on the hearts? The hearts are locked up. They don't care for to, to reflect on the Qur'an. Reflecting on the Qur'an in the heart doesn't mean that you become convinced it's Allah's word. You become convinced that it's talking to you. That Allah is talking to you personally. You are engaged in a private meeting with Allah in Salat. You have a private meeting with Allah when you're reciting Qur'an. That's the devil in the heart. Oh, that's an experience. There's no high like that one. There's none. There's no feeling like that one. It doesn't come all the time, by the way. It, it's a gift. It comes sa'a fa sa'a. Sometimes. You know? If we could have that all the time, we'd be different kinds of people. We'd be a different person. So now I want to share with you the importance of appreciating the Qur'an as a miracle for our hearts and a miracle for our minds. What's the importance of it? This is why I want to take you to Surah Al-Baqarah. I want to take you to a story that's very famous. It's a Sunday school story. So the kids here that go to Sunday school and are awake at least 25% of that time, which is difficult, probably know this story. Allah Azza wa says, or tells us about Ibrahim alayhi salam, when Qala Ibrahim, when Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Ibrahim talks to Allah a lot. Ibrahim alayhi salam talks to Allah a lot in the Quran. He talks to him about his kids. He talks to him about the future. He talks to him about himself. He talks to him about moving to Makkah. There's a lot of conversation between Allah and Ibrahim. So if you want to learn beautiful conversation between Ibrahim, uh, between a slave of Allah and Allah himself, there's two. There's Musa and Allah. Beautiful conversation. And there's Ibrahim alayhi salam and Allah. Just two beautiful sets of conversations in the Qur'an. So in one of these conversations, Ibrahim alayhi salam turns to Allah and says, Rabbi, my master, arini, show me. كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى How do you bring, how do you bring life to the dead? How do you bring the dead back to life? How do you do it? Can you show me? That's kind of amazing, huh? You know how a child might be curious how a car works and says to... Hey dad, can you take me to a factory? I want to see how they make cars. I want to go behind the scenes. That's a beautiful website. Let me see the source code. You know those of you that steal source code? Let me see the source code. That's a beautiful building. Let me see the blueprints. Let me see that. What's behind the scenes? My God. He asks Allah Azza wa Jal not, do you give life to death to the dead? Because he knows Allah does that. He doesn't say, you know, can you show me what it is? Can you bring life to the dead? Because he already has the answer to that. He wants to see how it happens. How does it work? How do you do it? I want to see. Allah asks the counter question. It's a beautiful conversation. Qala awalam tu'min. You haven't already believed? You don't already believe that I could do that? Huh. Allah Azza wa Jal is asking who about Iman? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam, by the way, is the, the role model of what Iman should look like. We want to know if, if there's like one solid Iman that keeps Allah keeps talking about as a case study in the Quran, it's the Iman of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Who of us would be in a position that a sharp knife is in your hand and you're putting it on your child's neck? That takes Iman. That's not, that's not, you don't question that Iman. That's pretty incredible. Who's going to see a gigantic flame? A gigantic flame. They say in some historic narrations, the flame was so big that birds from the sky would fall into it. And he's about to be catapulted into that flame. And he says, yeah, fine. It's all good. My God. That's Iman. And the, the, the wildest example of his Iman that comes to my mind and I've shared this in some talks before, not that he had to leave his family in Mecca. 
That's hard enough. Have you ever left your family somewhere, guys? Left your family at the airport for too long? Too late to pick them up from the mall? Late to pick your kid up from the school? You know? You're, you're calling them, you're calling the wife, you're, you're calling the child, and they're just going to voicemail. Does your mind go crazy? I've been calling you for 10 minutes. Where have you been? What's wrong with you? You know? I, I, my phone was off. <laughs> Though it wasn't, it's just my mom. It's just my mom. That's what's going on at the other end. You know? God, she doesn't stop. <laughs> But when you get caught, you're like, oh, my phone was dead. I don't understand why you would do that. <laughs> Leaving your family in an uncertain place. It could drive you crazy. Not knowing what's going to happen. It could drive you crazy. You know, when, I used to, when we used to live in Maryland, I used to pick up my kids from school. One time I overslept. And it's already 3 o'clock. I'm supposed to be there at school at 3 o'clock. I wake up and it's 3 o'clock at the house. And I get a text message from the wife. How are the kids doing? And I wrote back, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> and dash. And somehow, you know, her spider sense went berserk. And she said, you overslept, didn't you? The next text. You know. Then she, she called me, I picked up. How could you do this to my poor babies? They're going to be so scared and lonely. They're going to be so terrified. You know, you're going to be late. Oh, I can only imagine what they're going through. Yes, so poor, these children. They're going to be behind the gate, inside an air-conditioned room with the fan running and the teacher in front of them doing artwork. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know? It's terrifying. What is Ibrahim Alayhisam thinking as he's walking away? What's he leaving them if you guys have ever gone on a road trip, I have. I just came back from a plane trip with my family. I went to the Ikna convention with six kids. Whew! And Hijrafi Sabin and I tell you, traveling with children. But you're traveling in the car every five minutes. I'm too hot. I'm too cold. Can I move from my chair? Can I sit in the front? Can I sit in the back? How come she gets to the window? I don't get the window. Oh, God. What kind of air conditioning does Ibrahim salam have as he's walking, walking, not SUV, to the desert? Man, I even wonder about the road trip. Traveling is hard. Traveling with wife and kid? Oh man, that's tough. And a, the baby at that. Babies have so much, and they cry, and they get hot, you're worried about them, dehydration. And then he has to leave them there in the middle of nowhere. Or walk away. That takes Iman. That's Iman. And that same man, that same believer, turns to Allah and says, Ya Allah, after all of that, Ya Allah, can you show me how do you do this? Allah says, don't you have Iman already? His Iman is here, and his Iman is here. But you know, and let me tell you something about these two things. Our intellectual Iman, it only grows. It doesn't go back. It only grows. Spiritual Iman, like the heart, it has good days and it has bad days. Spiritual Iman can always use help. None of us ever will reach a state of Iman where we can say, I don't need more Iman, I'm good. It's, it's a fuel tank that you always have to keep refilling. So when Ibrahim alayhi salam wants to experience a miracle, is it the heart or the mind that he wants to keep filling up? The heart. The mind's already filled, he's convinced. He's absolutely convinced. So what's his answer? He says, Bala wala kinliyatma inna qalbi. No, no, of course I believe. When he says bala to me, Wallahu A'lam, he's talking about his intellectual iman. Intellectually, I have no doubts whatsoever. I have no doubts that you give life to the dead. I have no doubts that you're capable of doing it. But I'm only asking because I want to satisfy and put my heart at ease. Even Ibrahim alayhi salam has the, has the, feels the need to satisfy his heart. This is different from the kuffar we write about. The kuffar had doubts where? Here. That's why I made this distinction. They had doubts over here. Allah said, Quran is enough for them. Quran is enough for them for here, up here, and also for here. Now we already believe, alhamdulillah. We already believe. 
But you know what? Does, do our hearts still need some reinforcement sometimes? Oh yeah. They, they do. All of our hearts do. And Allah is saying, what is enough for that? Quran is enough. I want you to think about what I just said. Our hearts need reinforcement. And Allah's claim is, not my claim, Allah's claim is, Quran is enough for that purpose. Quran is enough. We have a big problem. Ramadan is around the court. That's a blessing. But the vast majority of the Muslims that walk on this earth are going to stand in Salat and they will have no idea what's being recited. They will experience the Qur'an without experiencing the Qur'an. It's a tragedy. To me, it's a state of emergency. It really is. That we're going to stand and listen to the word of Allah and we're not going to know what He's saying. And even if we have some idea of what He's saying, we're not going to be standing at the edge of a water watching water part. We're not going to be experiencing a miracle where we're so amazed by that we're so overwhelmed by that, that as we are standing there, it is com completely reinforcing in our hearts and in our minds, Word of God. This can only be Allah's Word. It can't be anything else. SubhanAllah. Can you imagine how powerless the Bani Israel felt when Allah raised the mountain above them? Imagine a mountain, ha mountain hanging above you. And then Allah says, take my book seriously. Okay. Sorry. That's how we're supposed to feel when what's being recited. The same Quran that Allah says, if that Quran came on a mountain, you'll watch it full of fear. It'll become numb. It'll become khushu. It literally means the muscles to become soft. So it's as though Allah is saying the mountain will first start melting. Then it'll explode from the fear of Allah. It can't take it. It can't take it. And how, how much harder than that do a, does a heart have to be that it listens to the entire Qur'an and not a tear comes down? How much harder than that rock, that, that boulder, that mountain does it have to be? Isn't that a tragedy? That's a, that's a pretty sad tragedy. And so we all make attempts. And I'm not blaming you for not knowing Arabic or not knowing the Qur'an. I'm saying there's a problem. Let's first recognize the problem. And let's try to do something to fix the problem. Let's try to get there. And wallahi, if we make the intention to come to the word of Allah, to clean up our hearts, to clean up our minds, Allah will open those roads. That's Allah's guarantee. That's not up to me or you. Allah guarantees that. You, just, you and I just have to make the intention. I, I want Allah's book to be a part of my life. I want it to be something that I can do, reflect upon, to clean my heart and clean my mind. And it, Allah will open those doors for you, Wallahi, in ways you could never imagine. So in this, you know, in this context, I want to share a few bits of advice with you. A few bits of advice that will help you and me get closer to the word of Allah. First things first. All of us, there is no exception in this room. All of us should be memorizing the Quran. All of us. Whether it's one ayah a day, two words a day, one word a day, I don't care. You should be memorizing the Quran. How much should I memorize? Don't ask that question. Let Allah answer that question. However much Allah opens your heart. You know where Allah, you know Allah told us? Where does the Qur'an rest? When you memorize something else, when you memorize your medical textbook, when you memorize your physics course, you memorize your, your, the answers for the exam, you memorize this or that or the other historical facts for your SAT or whatever. When you memorize things, where does that memory sit? Allah says in the same surah an Kabul, he, says, he tells us where the Qur'an sits inside a person. These are clear, miraculous signs in the chests of those who've been given knowledge. The best possible healing, the healing that was given to the world, we want it to rest inside our chest. Memorize the Quran, memorize the surah, memorize an ayah, but do it every single day. Brother, I don't know Arabic, it doesn't matter, just memorize. Just memorize. Have the intention that you want to learn, you want to understand. And I'm telling you, the people who memorize the Qur'an, Arabic, Tafsir, understanding, becomes a hundred times easier for them than the people who don't memorize. That's number one. Memorize the Qur'an. Second, whatever explanations of the Qur'an you find easy to understand, I personally, I'll tell you what my personal problem is. Maybe you don't have this problem. I'm not a good reader at all. 
I have very low attention span. When I read something, I only read it because I'm having problems going to sleep. Because two pages in, I know no, no sleeping pill will do for me what reading will do for me. MashaAllah. Okay? And this is especially true, by the way, for some of you when you recite Quran. All the, an army of shayateen comes to you and says, Sleep. Ah, you know you want to. You will have the best sleep of your life the moment you open the Muslim. Well, come put you to sleep. It's pretty awesome. I've tried it. I've tried it. When I, you know, especially on planes when I need rest, you start reciting. Before takeoff, I'm out, I wake up after landing. So for me personally, to learn tafsir and learn certain things, I just had to learn to become a good listener. And to me, personally, the khutbah I've listened to, the tafsir I've listened to, the talks and lectures I've listened to in Arabic or in Urdu or whatever else, they're still in my head. I was just listening to a talk I heard 12 years ago. And I still remember it. I was like, wow, I still remember that. I remember that he said that. It stuck in my head. You know? I didn't know where it came from, and I heard that talk, and I was like, wow, that's where it was. That's, that's how it entered my memory. Bank. So listening to durus of Qur'an, listening to explanation of the Qur'an is a really easy way to start building a relationship, especially durus of the lectures of the surahs you've already memorized. Lectures of the surahs you've already memorized. My intention for coming here was two things. I want to, uh, first of all, I wanted to experience meeting this community, alhamdulillah, and Maybe inshallah ta'ala in the future as, as time permits and family obligations allow and work obligations allow, I'd like to come visit you again inshallah ta'ala and hopefully we'll see each other again. But um, this particular trip I wanted to take the opportunity because I want to extend each and every one of you that are here and the, the community that's not here through you because you'll be ambassadors of this message for me. I wanted to invite you to a conference that I've put together with some friends in Dallas and it's on the 30th of June. It's on the 30th of June. It's called, no surprise, Amazed by the Qur'an. That's what the conference is called. And myself, my colleague Sheikh Abdul Nasser, some of you know who that is, and Imam Suhaib Webb from Boston. The three of us are going to be together at that conference. And he's really excited to come. I was just hanging out with him at the convention in Connecticut, uh, you know, two days ago. And he's super excited to come. SubhanAllah. So it's just a one-day program. And the point of it is, for us as a community to come back and experience why we are so amazed by the Qur'an. Yes, I, I want to be amazed by it by myself. I want to listen to those two. And even as I talk about it, Wallahi, it's a review for me. I tell you, when I was studying the Qur'an, certain surahs, when I was studying them from a one particular angle, beauty. And to, true story. I'm, I was studying the Qur'an, I still remember sitting there in my living room, I'm listening to some tafsir, and I'm, I'm taking some notes on an ayah, and I get to a point, and I was so overwhelmed, I had to put the pen down and leave and just go make such that, because I felt like, man, a mountain has just fallen on me. How can anyone disbelieve? This is so powerful. It's so heavy. It's so, so beautiful. It's so beautiful. You guys think the Avengers was awesome? It wasn't. That's nothing. It's garbage. You want to know how a story is told? The Qur'an knows how to tell a story. Allah knows how to tell a story. You haven't experienced it. You don't know. It's been, it's been undersold to you. It's been given to you in a translation that's archaic. Hast thou not seen it? You know? And you don't know. You, don't, you really don't know. I didn't know. I studied some of this stuff. I studied the story of Yusuf salam in translation. A long time ago. I was like, what's the big deal? I don't get it. Then I read it in Arabic. Like studied it, studied it. The language of the surah. And I was blown away at what was going on in the surah. It's incredible. It really is. It leads anything you'll experience. Especially stories in the Quran. Especially stories. The way Allah tells them is remarkable. And the way we tell them is, frankly, it's depressing. It's depressing. The way we tell our children stories from the Quran is just sad. We do such an injustice. Such a, uh, the typical Sunday school story, right? These kids are sitting, these 12 year olds are like. <sighs> no, they don't have watches. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. That's the, that one's doing that right now. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Feel bad. 
you know, that's, they're so hard to entertain. They're looking to be impressed. And the teacher is, on top of that, the teacher is depressed. Yusuf alayhi salam was the son of Yaqub, who was the son of Ishaq, and his brothers put him inside a well and left him there. Please put me in a well and leave me there. <laughs> that would be better than this. <laughs> right? You know how to tell the story. We have to, even the, the, the elders, the parents here, we have to be inspired by this book so we can instill inspiration. The Prophet ﷺ was describing this the last thing I'll leave you with. It's not just what the Qur'an has to say, it's how it says it. Allah chose the best words, He chose the best style, and He chose the most you know, a, a powerful teacher on earth to teach this lesson. You all know, you've sat in a class, how much of education depends on the teacher? A lot. It could be the same curriculum, it could be the same lesson, it could be the same students, but the teacher makes all the difference. This teacher will make you remember it for life, because he knows how to teach. He knows what he's doing. Allah says, يَقُصُّونَ alaykum ayati." My prophets, they narrate my ayat onto you. They don't just tell you, يُخْبِرُونَ بِكُمْ يُخْبِرُونَ كُمْ بِآيَاتِ They inform you of my miraculous signs. No, no, no. They narrate them. They animate themselves. They tell them, they make it alive when they present They'll captivate you. That's what my prophets do. That in and of itself is a sunnah. To tell the message of Islam in a way that is captivating. In a way that captures. And I don't, you know, I try to do that as much as I can for my own children. You know what I do for, for my kids? We, like on a weekly basis, we have a halaqa, a kid's halaqa. And a couple of the neighbors, we get together and we have a little program. And I'm doing the story of Musa alayhi salam with them. And what I do is I do it in episodes. Episode one. It's a dark night. Not the movie. It's a dark night. He's tra- there's a man traveling with his family. He's got a kid with him, a little kid with him. He's got his wife with him. And, they get, and it gets darker and darker and darker. And they don't know where to go. And all of a sudden, and these kids, their eyes are bulging out. There's a fire on top of a mountain. Who made the fire? Who did it? Shh! Don't say anything. This gets really crazy. Really? Yeah. You know what? Nobody could see the fire. Only this one man saw the fire. I didn't even tell him his name. The, the father, he saw the fire. And he told his family, hey, do you see that? He said, no, we don't see anything. And they said, okay, just wait here. In the middle of the dark, just wait here. I'll go. And he started climbing up the mountain in the middle of the dark. Can you imagine how scary that must be? Climbing up a mountain in the middle of the dark? Dude, it's crazy. One time, I was in my room, and the lights were off. <laughs> I love those, those interjections. They're so awesome. Yeah, I was like that. Is it like going up the stairs? No, it's worse. <laughs> and as he got up there, he heard, Musa. What's that? That's his name. That's his name? <laughs> Who said it? I don't know. He doesn't know either. He didn't know either. He didn't know what to do. Nudia, ya Musa. Musa, my God, you're going up to meet a stranger. You don't even know who's going to be up there. And you hear what? Your own name. Not even, hey man, are you over there? Come here. Nothing like that. He already knows his name. In the dark, and in the dark, he can't even see. Whoever's talking can see in the dark. Whoever's talking can already see in the dark. <laughs> and whoever's talking even knows, he knows people that are strangers to everyone. For him, no one's a stranger. Because he went to a strange place, he's never been there before, right? So whoever, now you guys think, who can see in the dark? Everyone and everything. And who is someone that no one is a stranger to? These kids are like, I don't know. Who knows everybody? You mean like everyone? Yup, everyone. I thought that was a lot. Bingo. <laughs> Allah was talking to him? Yup, Allah. Then what happened? I'll tell you next episode. <laughs> oh. But that's what you're supposed to do. Believe him like, tell him what happened. You know? Really? 
When I when I t get to the part of the snake, I actually literally bring a rope and start and put on a YouTube video of a giant python. This guy. Can you imagine? I don't want to look at it. It's scary. Yeah, it was pretty scary. That was pretty scary. And then you know what Allah tells us? Grab it. So if you bring a toy snake and you ask a child to grab it, will they? If it's moving around? No. Is that, is that scary? Grabbing it? Can you imagine? Allah just said, hey, don't be afraid. Just grab it. Take it with your hand. Musa alayhi was thinking of running off the mountain. And by the way, running off of a mountain in the dark, right, running at all down a mountain is a bad idea. It's a pretty scary idea. So he's weighing, what's scarier? Running down a mountain in the dead of the night or facing the snake. So clearly the snake is really terrifying. And Allah says to him, no, do what? You know what you do? With your hand. Ah, don't be afraid, don't worry about it. <laughs> then what happened? Musa Al got closer and closer to the snake and he grabbed it. And then all of a sudden, I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> you're supposed to do with this story. So my child never forgets. So I'm driving home from school and my kids are saying to me, Abba, you know when that happened with Musa Aisha, with the snake? That was crazy. <laughs> They're not telling me, you know what happened in, you know, whatever, Jimmy Neutron or Dora the Explorer or <laughs> the Avengers or... They're not telling me that was crazy. What do you mean, Musa Aisha, that snake thing? That was amazing. That was amazing. What happened next? I can't tell you until later. Sorry, guys. That's season two. Not coming out yet. That's what we're supposed to do with our children. So the intent that day is to do that for the adults and the kids. It's to take a passage of the Quran and to share with myself and all of you and my family and your family what makes it awesome. The registration is actually online only. And I'm expecting an audience from all across the country. And I'm hoping we have the strongest showing from Texas itself. And that's what, part of the reason I've, I've, I've made this road trip here, to let you guys know I wanted to share this with you guys and also make the announcement for that program. The website again is amazedbythequran.com. So if you could do me the favor of registering as soon as possible, and also please, 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 the most important kind of you know, advertising is word of mouth. It's not Facebook, it's not flyers, it's not announcements, it's when you guys talk about something with your friends and family. So do me the favor, of talking about it with friends and family, inshallah ta'ala. And may Allah Azza put barakah in that program and help us make that a tradition every year that we come back and we rejuvenate our spirits with the Qur'an year after year after year. So thank you so very much for listening. And on this weeknight and all of you are going back to work. I'm going back to conduct an exam for my students at 8 in the morning tomorrow. So I got to get out of here too, inshallah ta'ala. But it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure coming here. I pray that we get, get a lot of time with each other in the future, inshallah ta'ala and that we're able to get to know each other better. But I hope to see all of you and your families in uh, the conference. And if not here, and if not there, inshallah, we'll meet in a much better place. Barakallahu wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.